that working? Is that working? Hmm. Yes, Ember. I just need to make sure that this is working properly. Do I have anybody watching this stream to tell me if this is working properly? Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. rabbit foot, which is Ember's favorite thing. Ember, sit. Hmm, I wonder if I can look up to here, to this mess over here. Please ignore the giant pile of garbage in the corner of my studio. And we're gonna focus on the doggo. Yes. Ooh. Can we, can we, oh, sorry. Can we focus on the doggo? Yeah. Ember. Ember down. Let me see if I can get, pull a chat up here so that I can see what we're doing, how we're doing. Um, hopefully I've got some people watching who can tell me how this is going. Ember, can you down please? Down please. Down. Yes, that's a good girl. That's a good girl. You're going to settle and you're going to be helpful, right? Ember's going to settle and be helpful. You're going to settle and be helpful and be good. You want this? Ember wants this. Hi. Hi everyone. Um, she is, yeah, she's definitely more relaxed. She's grown into her crazy a little bit. Um, I'm actually surprised at how chill she's been today because she didn't really get any exercise yesterday. She didn't really seem to want it. Um, I mean, we did play a bit, but she hasn't, we didn't really go for much of a walk. Um, she'll, she'll definitely want to walk after this, but uh, she's a good girl. She was napping until, of course, until I turned on the camera. At the moment I turned on the camera, she was all over wanting to be part of it. So she's gonna be good, right? You're gonna be good? Okay, I'm gonna put this, hey, wait, wait, wait. So she is very good about waiting for her treats. That's under there. Yeah, it's under there, isn't there? Okay, actually, I'm gonna put it somewhere else. Ember, wait. Good girl. Um, so she's well behaved, but uh, She definitely has her moments where she's hyperactive and loud and ridiculous, but um, she's a good dog. She's a good girl, right? Ember, you're my good girl. You're my good baby. Okay, you can have it. You can have it. You can have it. Oh yeah, it's for you. These are her favorite things. She loves them. And she also has it. Oi. Well, that was a pain. Okay, I need to get a new stand for this. I've got a microphone stand that I'm using for holding up my camera and the, this camera is just a little too big for it. So. Uh, 
Uh, let me make sure that you've got a nice crisp picture here. Uh, so this image is what I was working on last week. Sorry, just want to make sure that I've got this all adjusted properly. Uh, oh, interesting. I set it to here, then adjust it. Is that crisp? Let's see here. Okay, how's that for crispness? Anyway, so um, Ember will be in and out. She hasn't had her lunch, so I've got some food here for her. If she gets noisy, I'll uh, try to feed her first and then, then see about um, taking her outside. So I haven't really, I've been working at the studio, so the only painting that I've done this week I've done not at this desk, which means that I've still got this messy plate and um, some really yucky water here from last week. Um, and I'm gonna work on this same piece. So I'm gonna pull up the reference photo. Thank you, Gabra, for sending this. And I will, um, yeah, get to work on this. Okay, so here we go. I still, I could have sworn that I got myself a black, like an actual black in casein, and I cannot find it, but I did find myself, I did find one other tube that I have, which is a Payne's Gray. And so I think that what I'm really missing in this piece is some contrast, some depth. <laughs> Hi, buddy. I know you're very loud, but mama needs to work. Can you be nice? Can you be helpful? Come here, come here. You, here. Touch. Thank you, sit. Yes, good girl, good girl, good girl. Would you like some treats? You would like some treats, okay. You can have some treats. Um, so I'm going to try to darken up some areas, lighten up some areas, bring in some contrast. Do you plan to use casein to finish it or jump to gouache? That's an interesting question. I'm going to keep going with casein for a while. And then um, I'm not sure if I'll jump to gouache on this piece, but that's also something that I've been meaning to try is to do some pieces where I have a mix, where I have... Um, casein and gouache. I don't know if this is one of those pieces that I'm going to try that on. Um, I am... What do we have here? Yeah, this will work. So I need to get some really dark, dark colors. Um, this Payne's Gray is not very dark. Also, I'm trying... I have this plate, and so I, I know from past experience that although casein will set, like it forms a closed surface, it's still very easy to wash off. So I'm not worried about things having dried on the plate. I'll still be able to wash them off. But this is too light ember. Excuse me, do you self-serve treats? 
Do you sit on my chair? No, you do not. Shh, I know you come here, come here. Down, down girl, down. I know, you want to contribute. Yes, you like the sound of your own voice and you hear me talking so you want to talk too, right? Yes, yes, I know you, I, I know, down. cleared customs but only after I paid 10 euros. Oh gosh. That's a real pain. I've had a real struggle with my sketchbooks. Um, they got, there was an emergency, like a, a problem in, um, okay so this is much darker. I do like that. So that's good. Because I was having trouble getting a dark enough color. And by mixing the Payne's Gray with some raw umber, I can get something much darker. Although I may still go in with gouache and get some very dark colors because I just want to make sure that I have enough contrast on this piece. It's looking a little bit bubblegum to me still. Like, I like using bright colors, but, you know, you, you need some, some, some dark and deep colors to... Um, to contrast it. Um, so I may switch to gouache uh, in a little bit to get a little bit more um, depth than I can really get with my selection of casein. I also think that I can probably get a little bit more detail in gouache. Um, casein really doesn't seem to like being watered down at all, whereas with gouache, you can use it almost like more of a watercolor. So I may switch. We'll see. But uh, at first, I just want to make sure that all the areas of deepest color are deepened in. Create some depth in here. Anyway, um, yeah, my sketchbooks, I mean, I took forever to send them, and then they got uh, stuck in um, there were some BC storms, so they got stuck. I think that, that usually they would have gone through to the US direct and then gone across the continent, but instead they went to BC because of issues with the postal service or something. Um, then there were the beastie storm, so they got stuck there. Eventually got sent back to me and then ended up at, but a third of my mail is being sent to another address. Um, it's like, it's around the corner. So I'm, say I'm at number 100, I'm not, but if I was at number 100, my street is being sent to number 100. Uh, at a different street, so, um, yeah. Uh, luckily, the person who's receiving them has been really nice, and so she's bringing me my mail. I get some of her mail. I've had to bring her mail over twice. Um, we don't know what's going on with the postal service. We called to complain. Now, a lot of our packages come with our house number written real big on them, like they know who's complaining, but but still the house number, not the, yeah. I'm 
her. Off. Off, please. No dogs on the table. Off. Excuse me. Yep. Yes, here. Good girl. Good here. Sit. Down. Down. Yes, good girl. Good down. Good girl. You want this. You want this. Ember wants this. Okay, you can have it. Oh, and my reference computer has just turned its screen off. Hold on. Okay. So if anybody needs the reference image, um, this is, it's in general in my um, Discord channel. Um, Gabor sent it. Uh, it is wonderful. <laughs> Thank you so much. And um, yeah, the Discord link is in the video description. So I actually am on top of that, sort of. So deepening the shadows is definitely helping here. Um, I just want to add a little bit more here. I'm surprised at how much um, this casein is rehydrating on the plate after a week. Like I know that it's always easy to scrub off, but it, I'm surprised at how much it seems to just be rehydrating um, because it is, you know, semi-permanent. It, it does form a closed film usually, so. So like, for example, here I have my yellows. I'm surprised that I'm able to make something that's even remotely looking like a, a yellow mix, given that I don't, you know, I am gonna put some fresh yellow down, but I hadn't. Hey buddy, sit please, sir. I know, hello honey, sit. Here you go, sit, uh-uh, here. Yes, good girl. Good girl. Yeah, you're my good girl. I bet you're hungry. I bet you're hungry. You haven't, you've been turning down food all day. I know. You've been turning down food all day. Why have you been turning down food all day? Hmm? Why is that? Why is that? So we're going to take some of the, oh yeah, a bit. The paint's gray. We're going to add it to my yellows here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then add a little bit of texture there. Add a little bit more of the Payne's Gray. Add a little bit more texture. Add a little bit more of the Payne's Gray. Add a little bit more texture. What's everyone been up to this week? I brought some pencils to give to everyone 
in the exchange. Oh, that's so sweet. Ember down. Off. Hey, 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 off. No, no dogs on there. No dogs on the table. No, off. Off. I don't want you on my table. Off. I know Laura lets you on the table. Off. <laughs> so Ember had finally mostly rid herself of the habit of hopping up her just her front legs on the table um, but then her trainer um, we have a, a dog trainer and groomer in the same building as the studio just next door um, and so I've been taking her to work with me to try to get her used to behaving like a service dog um, but then she goes and spends an hour with Laura every day. And Laura was teaching her to get up on the grooming table. And Ember, who generally is very bad about generalizing any kind of instructions, uh, was very eager to generalize that one. Sorry, I am entertaining a dog while painting, which means, of course, less painting happening and more talking to a dog off screen. I know, wait. Wait, baby. Wait. Good girl. Good wait. Good girl. Yes, good girl. Good girl. Are you a good girl? You're a good girl. Mm-hmm. You're my good baby. Good wait. Good girl. Yes, that's a good girl. You're my good girl. Uh-huh, you're my good girl. That is a good girl. You're a good girl. Mm -hmm. That's a good girl. What a good girl I have. Okay. So this isn't going to be as detailed as like a, uh, you know, formal botanical art piece by any means. Um, not really what I'm aiming for here, but I do want to get some amount of fairly fine detail into this piece. Hey, buddy. Hello. Hello. Yes. Sit. Oh, my good girl. Good sit. Good girl. Down. Number down. Yes. Good girl. Good down. Settle. Good girl. Good girl. Her release word is okay. And turns out I use it a fair bit outside of releasing her, which means that when she's being very good and waiting for something, she's not the best at um, actually moving when she's given her release. But that when I uh, don't want her to necessarily get up because she just heard it um, and then got up, I tell her off for that. Right, buddy? Yes. Good girl. Good down. Good girl. Yes. Settle. Good settle. Hi, you. Hi, you. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, we're hand feeding you. We're hand feeding you because that keeps you nice and calm. Responsive. Keeps me from working. I still struggle with getting the right consistency of this stuff um, and then judging value and tone when building up um, like lighter areas. Uh, so that's definitely a thing. You know, some bad habits from watercolor. Well, maybe not bad habits, but you bring a certain understanding to your work. I know, buddy. Ember, off. Off. No dogs on my chair. Off. Good girl. off for a moment to finish my dinner. Oh, okay, and I need to put on some of these. Then a little bit more with the yellow, get some of that brightness in. Yeah, um, and then I'm actually going to, ooh, I need a little bit of white. And my cadmium green to make some like really acidy green again. Mm hmm. It's a lighter acidy green. Ah, and my screen keeps turning off. I know, I'm juggling three things a screen, a dog, and a. Okay, what are you burying there, buddy? What are we burying? Oh, you found your, your chew. Why don't you chew it? Uh-huh. Yeah, chew. It's for you. It's for you. You don't want it? You don't want your chew? Okay, what if I steal it? It's mine now. My chew now. My piece of... I don't know. Pork hide? She gets a... We order from a local um, dog treat manufacturer that just dries up a bunch of animal parts. And Ember, when she doesn't feel like chewing something, the chews that she likes slightly less, she hides them. She buries them all over her house and in the yard. Okay. Yes, Ember, do you want to go outside? Do you want more food? Do you want more food and then outside? You want more food and then outside? Okay, come. Here. Good girl. Good girl. Good baby. Yes. Here. Ember, here, good girl.
You want to go outside? Okay. I'm going to take you outside in a moment, but first I'm going to give you a little bit more food, okay? Here. Good girl. Good here. Here. Touch. Yes. Sit, please. Sit. I can see that you're not sitting. Good girl. Down. Good girl. Good girl. Yes. This is a good girl. This is a good baby. This is a good baby. I know, I like it when you're all good and obedient and not loud. She's been snuggling with the cat every day, which is really sweet. Like I can't get over how much I love that. Yes, it definitely switches to the middle, like if, in fact, a little bit more than gouache. Feels to me that it would be easier with a smaller brush. It would, but I am tr de deliberately trying to um, not get caught up in details too much and um, use a bigger brush to just get my main, to focus on um, getting my main um, color values in rather than very, very precise location of colors. So it's a different focus. Um, and it's kind of what I prefer to focus on with um, casein because you're not going to be able to get the same level of detail easily that you would with watercolor anyway. It just doesn't disperse off the brush the same way. So I'm being a little bit rougher. I mean, the thing is I'm on, on hot press paper, but this is where cold press paper is, um, shines. If you uh, are willing to work with it, is that it'll create some of that broken texture and you're creating the suggestion of detail with tonal variation, which is something that I'm not very good at, but it's, um, that's the value of sketching and trying different media and stuff is you, you learn skills that you can bring to the table. So I would definitely be more comfortable with a smaller brush at this point, but I am using a larger brush because I feel like it is more beneficial to what I want to get out of this piece, if that makes sense. Also because it's what I had handy. <laughs> I don't want to use my nice sables on um, something like this, so I, I mean, I, I do have smaller synthetics that I could absolutely dig up, um, but this one was close and frankly, uh, it works for what I needed to do. Ember snuggling with the cat? Uh, well, not right now. Right now she is, right now I'm hand feeding her. I've got, we call this Ember's Trail Mix. And it's um, her regular kibble, some other like regular puppy kibble, but it's just a different brand. So she thinks it's exciting. Um, it's got some nuts, some, sorry, some seeds. Uh, so these are pumpkin seeds, coconut, apple, some little bits of treats, some uh, dried bits of dead animal, um, various things in it. It varies day to day what's in Ember's kibble, but, um, or Ember's trail mix, but Ember is not particularly food motivated. Um, so when I want her to focus on doing tough tasks and I want some encouragement besides, like mostly she is um, focused because she wants to show everyone that she's the smartest, which works. I mean, whatever, whatever her motivation is, right? Um, 
not really a problem that that's her motivation, but uh, when I want something extra, it would be nice to have something immediate that's like an actual treat. The problem is because she does so much training, um, I need to be giving her uh, balanced food when I'm training her. Otherwise, um, she'd be getting like mostly treats because um, she gets fed out of hand a lot. Um, so a lot of people will suggest, like a lot of trainers suggest, just using kibble as treats. Don't feed them in a bowl, just feed them their kibble, but use that as a feeding reward. Unless she is very, very hungry, um, she, that won't work. And she's not always very, very hungry. She's happy to go all morning without eating. Or if she is very, very hungry, then she's a different kind of bratty. Um, so what we do is we switch things up and we give her some food that's a little bit more exciting than her regular kibble um, by making her trail mix. But it's still mostly kibble and still has other stuff that she finds yummy but is good for her. And um, Vet's fine with it and Ember's fine with it. It does mean that she gets, well, it looks like trail mix. Uh, do you use a rag for, you know what I usually do and I don't have a rag on me right now. Um, let me see if I've got one nearby. Yes, I prefer to clean my brushes on rags, um, so you'll see, like, this has actually been through a laundry cycle with bleach, but you can still see it's got all sorts of colors in it, um, because I do tend to use a rag, although sometimes I'm just sitting here and I just don't have anything handy, and it doesn't occur to me to remedy that, because, I don't know, ADHD. Hi, buddy! Hello! Yes! Good girl, sit! Girl, sit, sit, hey, sit. You don't get rewards for not sitting. Sometimes I cut up dog salami so the kibble has a taste of it. Yes, so we also, um, this one's all dry because it's just, uh, because she is hungry. Um, and because I was in a rush. So I keep the dry stuff together and then we often cut up something that's got a little bit of moisture so that it'll get the, the flavors. Um, you know, the smells nice and nice and mixed up. Um, so sometimes, sometimes, yeah, that'll be um, like sausages or um, sometimes we'll just like make some ground beef or something, um, scrambled egg. Uh, sometimes she gets some cheese shreds. Uh, she doesn't seem to do too well with lactose. So uh, we get lactose free cheese. Um, her digestion is really, really fantastic, but um, if I if I have to guess, lactose is probably one of the things that she doesn't get along as well with. Um, so she does get some lactose-free cheese. Um, she gets what else does she get? Um, lots of like fresh fruit, um, vegetables. She likes cooked green beans, um, blueberries strawberries, apples, pears, although she's been turning down food with pears, so I don't know, maybe she doesn't like pears. Um, she really likes avocado, although it's not super useful for putting in food because it's too mushy. A um, little bit of corn, although that's not really, doesn't really have any major benefits to her.
Well, so I have trouble with how, um, like how solid the paint is with when it's really neat. Um, so yeah, definitely, definitely struggling with like a lot of aspects of, of, um, painting with more opaque media. Um, like a lot of these aspects are still really challenging to me, but. But I do have a rag now, so that's, <laughs> that's a win. Hey, Amber. Hey, bud. Sit, please. Amber. Yeah, butt down, butt down, sit. Hey. <clears throat> sit. Good, good sit. High five. Yes. Oh, high five. High five with your paw. Yeah, good girl. Yeah, so the one from it's so nice that I started wanting one. I don't need more stuff. My goodness, do I ever need less stuff? I need less stuff in my life. Um, I need to go through another purge. There's too much stuff in this house. <laughs> I need less stuff. So. So that's definitely helping with the shopping. It's just this feeling of overwhelm with the stuff that I have and needing to, needing to get rid of, um, you know, a good half of everything that I have in this house in order to not be overwhelmed by it all the time. Although I do have to say I've been eyeing, um, there's like projects that I keep on thinking like, oh, maybe I want to take on, like we're redoing our living and dining room as part of a big renovation. Um, we're tearing down the walls and putting new flooring in. Um, we have dropped ceilings, so we need to take out the ceilings. That's a whole thing. Um, and as part of that, I keep thinking like, oh, okay, well, we're taking out a fake fireplace, so, what do I want? What do I want to replace it with? Wouldn't it be nice to have a green wall, like a plant wall? Oh yeah, it'd be super nice to have a plant wall. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. On an aeroponic system? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That's what I want. <laughs> but uh, at least in that case, it's like, well, we need to get to that point of the renovation, which is really the last part anyway. Um, so once we're at that point, then. Maybe I will if I'm on top of my life or if that's like if that if we take forever getting there because we're not moving very fast on the renovation at all um, then uh, then I won't <laughs> okay I think I have mostly exhausted this little wolf's hunger yes little wolf do you want to go outside do you want to go outside yes Mm hmm Do you want to go outside? You want to go outside? Yes? Outside. Oh, good girl. Yes. Um, so I'm going to just take her outside, and I will be right back. So I'm just going to tether her out my side door. I'll be right back. Hey, buddy. Yes. Let's go outside. You go outside. Go, 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 go. Good girl. Go, 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 go.
Okay, so that's it for the dog distraction for right now. So I'm going to get back to actually painting. Sorry about that. that looks like a climbing wall. Uh, okay, describe this vision to me. I'm having trouble picturing it. I mean, it sounds really cool. I like it. I'm just having trouble picturing it. So I need your help. Describe what a plant climbing wall in my uh, living room looks like. All those foot and hand holds and spreading plants, you might trample a few. Oh, okay, yeah. I mean, I have high ceilings, or I will at least once I once we raise them, but they're not that high. <laughs> About eight foot six, so you know. Keep that in mind. Um, but like we could, I guess. Um, but I was thinking much fuller than that. So then I just need to start working on some of this stuff down here, get some more of this built up. Oh, you know what? I'm going to work on in this area, getting some more of the depth and detail in. I'm kind of liking how this is turning out. I mean, it's not certainly not the most detailed or clear piece, but it is, you know, getting somewhere with it. Put it outside. <laughs> uh, my house doesn't really have much of an outside. And we're kind of all, all tapped out on outside with just the like crazy amount of stuff that we've put there already. Um, and spilling into both the neighbors at this point. <laughs> uh, which is great. And we get along great with our neighbors, but you know, um, I do have to be somewhat aware that like half of the yard space that I'm using right now is not even mine. We, um, we let Ember out. She likes living outside. Um, it's not the most practical thing. I am a neuron. Okay, apparently today is the day of just like all the studio assistants being not very helpful. Hello, my little studio assistant. Are you going to help today? You're going to help today. Ah. No, you're not. You're just going to make chaos and destruction. Hello, my little chaos and destruction. Let's pull this up. Let's pull this out of the way a little bit. I know, I know. Look at my tiny chaos and destruction. Look at the tiny chaos and destruction. I know, you're so cute. You're so cute. You're so cute. Yes, so cute. Yeah, 
Uh-huh. Oh my goodness. No, that's not for you, buddy. Oh, yes. I know, sweetheart. I know. Oh, I know. What do you want? You want to walk all over my paper. I know, baby. So this one's been snuggling with Ember, which is real cute. Um, as long as she refrains from putting her paws on him <laughs> or using him like fully as a pillow, like putting her weight on her or putting her weight on him or licking his face or like right up his butt. He really enjoys those snuggles. So he'll actually, the reason why he's here, I think the real reason why he's here, I mean, he'd probably like me to go downstairs and feed him some dinner. But aside from that, Aside from wanting me to go downstairs and feed him some dinner, he also probably... I'm having trouble. Yeah, okay. There we go. Um, he also probably wants me to... Um, bring his sister in. He'll do that where he just, he'll hang out by the door and de like demand that I bring her inside when she's outside because he wants snuggles, which is really cute. Really super duper cute. Um, he's also, she's taught him how to herd humans. So now we have a herding cat as well as a herding dog. He'll come underfoot and like nudge at your ankles and make you go the place that he wants you to go to. Very cute. We love our cute babies. We love the cute babies, but yes, kind of problems. Okay, so let's see what else I've got. I need to get some in here. Get a really light, bright light, warm tone because some of these came out way too cool toned. So I need to come out here and get this with a warm tone yellow, this with a warm tone yellow, this with a warm tone um, this one's gonna need even more, so I'm gonna, yep. Paolo, I would encourage you to look into biological controls, which are like you can get little predatory mites. Um, garden stores will sell them and they'll eat things like aphids. I mean, if it's your balcony, then um, likely you'll end up with uh, ladybugs or whatever local uh, aphid eating things coming in on their own as well, but um, you can also buy biological controls if you are struggling with um,
Huh. I would think they do. Um, they, t they were pretty prevalent um, in many parts of Europe long before they became available in Canada. Uh, but I don't, like, I can't, not, don't know anything about Portugal specifically, but I definitely take a look. A wild calla lily. Oh, that sounds nice. Whatever the name is. Okay. Do I want to switch to a smaller brush? That is the question. Oh. I will, I will switch to a smaller brush. Uh, yeah, different pigments will be affected differently, but uh, there's definitely a like a general um, like regression to the middle with the uh, tones on. Yes, he's very cute. He came and helped. Oh, I see. No, he would like food. He would like food. He would also mm -hmm. probably like his sister, who's outside. Hmm. Should I let her back in? No. <laughs> I will feed him. Thank you. Art rooms. Fascinating. The painting looks good when I step away from the desk and see it as more of a th thumbnail. The fungus co colors look good together. Yeah, yeah, so it's definitely more of an impressionist thing. Like up close, there's a lot of mess. And I think that's sort of where I'm going to leave it. Like I'm trying to clarify some of the shapes in here, but like I'm not going to, I'm more just concerned with like trying to get the depth um, in this piece as well. Uh, rather than like a very specific, um, you know, in like really detailed look at what this fungus looks like. Right? Just a different sort of perspective. Um, so, uh, more of an impressionist thing. Um, so different from my usual stuff. Uh, but, yeah, we'll see. Just trying to focus on tones right now. I found that um, I've been doing a bunch of pieces with backgrounds lately, and um, I really struggle with them. Like, I really, really struggle with them. So it's something that I've been trying to work on is, like, how to get, you know, a multi-layered piece with a bunch of different things um, all together and getting all of my tones all lined up and correct over a whole spread and focusing less on detail because like I know that I can paint detail well um 
So, so just like addressing where my own weaknesses with my art are. Um, of it where did you land on the background question you asked on IG lately um I didn't get too very many answers um like I think I know where I'm what I feel um uh I have been sort of like I don't know if it's meaningful I have been I, I was looking through who the people are who liked different posts um and that one has gotten like not a whole lot of interaction from botanical artists. Now, granted, it's not a botanical piece. So that might be part of it. Um, I know that it's definitely the botanical, like the botanical world would strongly react to the statements I made there. Um, which is fine, like that was the point, but um, so to, so to clarify to anyone who missed this, I made a post on Instagram with one of my pieces that has a very diffuse background, but it has a background, which is not something that I've done in a lot of my work. Um, I have mostly stuck to plain white backgrounds, which is the botanical art convention. Um, scientific illustration in general, but in particular botanical art. Um, and botanical art, unlike the rest of the scientific illustration world, um, uh, is very, very <laughs> traditionalist, very, very tied to these um, conventions of, you know, this is, this is the one and only way to, to paint plants. Um, and I have this feeling like some of that convention, I mean, there are reasons for it. There are cases where you might want to paint with no, like just paint a single plant with no background. I'm not saying that I'll never do it again. Um, but I think that some of the attachment to that convention, some of the reason, some of the place where that convention comes from is really tied to, um, sort of colonial thinking um, where the origins of botanical art are very based on um, you know discovering new plants from strange lands and Victorian herbaria um, sort of collections this idea of um, separating a plant from its environment where plants are valuable in um, only in a, in a, like a museum setting completely separate from their surrounding, um, environment, a really devaluing the contribution of, um, things that are tied to it. So there's things that to this day are, are really, um, fiercely debated in the botanical art world uh, that, well, I mean, among other things, make my work a little bit uh, controversial <laughs> among botanical artists. Um, so notably, like, even including things like a pollinator insect or um, a damaged leaf, like a damaged plant because it's all this idea of like, you want to show the exact perfect growth of exactly how this plant is in, in the absence of any influence from anything else. Now there has been some changes to that, but like it's still very, very prevalent in the thinking in the botanical art world. Um, and so I made this post with a armadillo painting. It's not botanical but discussing how a lot of my work had been um, done without a background. Um, 
but that I'd been using it sort of as a crutch. Like I'm not, you know, I, I don't often paint backgrounds, but it's not because I feel like that's necessarily the best way to paint at all, but because it's a way that I find easier. Um, I don't have to worry about um, tying different parts of a painting together, right? Just paint the subject, don't have to compose a background, don't have to worry about a whole bunch of things, um, which I don't think is necessarily um, the best art, and so I've been trying to challenge myself to paint things with backgrounds, setting myself tasks that involve backgrounds, but then um, I just drag on forever because I, like, I find it so challenging to try to tie something back to its background, tell a story, but also not distract from the area of focus. There's like just so many extra things that um, get involved with including a background in um, scientific art pieces and in botanical art pieces. Um, even though I think in, in many cases it would be beneficial, like I think that you know, to truly understand a plant, you need to understand where it grows, what's around it, um, what other species it interacts with. And so um, there's real value to that. Um, but it's the sort of thing that I've uh, largely not been very publicly loud about, even though it's a thing that I think about quite a bit. Um, because, because that's very, that's a matter of hot debate in the, uh, botanical art world, and I'm not always inclined to have that hot debate with anybody. So yeah, so, uh, thoughts on botanical art, colonialism. <laughs> well, uh, Impressionist paintings also sometimes look really great when you come closer to them, but you don't necessarily see as much of the subject when you come closer. You just, it just sort of falls apart into little shapes. And I would be fine with that outcome here. Don't need it to be um, a recognizable thing at every distance. Um, but yes, I am focusing on making it a recognizable thing from a further distance, making it more tied together from a further distance in this case. So I feel like that's where I've personally struggled more. A technical drawing of a machine so it would not have the desk or a wall in the background. Well, yes, except if the desk and the wall contributed to its functioning, right? Like a drawing of a machine, you wouldn't say that it's wrong if it includes um, the inputs that it needs. So what I think is a bit... Um, and I am going to use the word colonial, even though, uh, like, I know that it, that particular choice of word is more than anything likely to generate some debate 
in the art community is this idea of, you know, plants can exist in isolation. Like, like they're valuable as a specimen in a museum, but like they don't exist in a, as a specimen in a museum. You know, you have plants that won't, they need their surrounding environment. You have parasitic plants that need to um, piggyback on other plants to live. You have plants that are heavily dependent on specific kinds of pollinators. You have plants that, um, I mean, they might not need it, but they always exist with stuff growing on them. Like, you know, there are other parasitic plants that always take over on them. And so I think that um, whether you're painting for identification purposes or understanding the plant, I mean, are there cases where you want to have a white background? Sure, of course. And I'm not saying that I'm never going to paint a white background again. I absolutely 100% am. Like, that's going to happen. Um, and I will continue to paint a lot of white backgrounds. I don't think that there's anything wrong with using a white background sometimes when it's a choice, but the um, exclusive policy of like, you know, there are, there are botanical art societies that will not consider your work. They will immediately um, reject it if there's a pollinator insect in it. Like, okay, but like, you know, if the point is to, to inform about the function or the, the form and function of this plant, then um, that pollinator insect is an important part of that story. Um, and, you know, you have to make some allowances for sometimes that needs to be included. Um, and this idea of, uh, you know, botanical documentation only happens for in an individual species in isolation is um, not true. <laughs> and it's a lot of what's wrong with, with the world today. And checking lots of botanical books or books with botanical illustrations. I think that genre is kind of dead, not artsy enough. And most looks a bit odd. Well, I mean, so there's like the, the botanical illustration, like the formal, um, you know, scientific journals look, which, um, you know, some people really like that. Um, I can tell you that there's still a market for it. Uh, Uh, I also think that limiting the idea of botanical illustration to only work that looks like a certain thing is kind of ridiculous. Like every other field in the world evolves, you know, as you learn more, as the world changes, you adapt and you paint things in a different way. Um, I think that if you are painting plants for the purpose of communicating scientific, uh, like botanical understanding. So you're painting, whether it's for a field guide or for a science textbook or like whatever, if it has a scientific plant knowledge bent to it, um, can be a children's book, can be very, very, um, abstracted. I think that should still count as botanical art. Um, and I think if you speak to individual botanical artists and you explain it that way, most of them will agree with you. But the reality is that if you are a new artist and you come into a botanical art space and you present a piece that looks, say, cartoony, um, that's a diagram of, you know, plant respiration, and you show a cartoony image of that, and you say, this is my botanical art piece. My opinion, 
that's a botanical art piece, but you're gonna get a whole bunch of botanical artists telling you that's not botanical art, your background is wrong, you haven't counted the number of stamens on the plant, blah, 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 blah this and that. And even if you do something like you paint a plant on a green background with some pollinator insects, you're gonna get a lot of botanical artists saying that's wrong. There's, you shouldn't have cast shadows in your piece. You shouldn't have pollinator insects. You shouldn't have blah, blah, blah. This, these are hot debates in the botanical art community. And maybe that means that that community of people um, is kind of dead. Um, that may well be true. I was hoping that it wasn't when I uh, joined botanical art societies. I thought that maybe they just might need a nudge in the right direction. But I think that you might be right that what, what's actually dead is that community of people, that, that thinking. Um, which sucks because it means that they're not gonna, there's a lot of valuable knowledge and technique and built up experience and, um, you know, gallery shows and what have you, that would be great to be passed on to people who are painting plants today. Um, and that's not going to happen if, uh, if all of the botanical art communities go the way of the dinosaurs because we refuse to acknowledge that sometimes plants are painted differently. Sometimes they have curled leaves that have been chewed by insects and that is not an invalid way of presenting a plant if that is how the plant always looks. Um, like if that's how the plant usually looks, then that is more accurate in my opinion than something that has perfect leaves. Um, more scientifically accurate, and yet, um, and yet, you know, that is a, that is a big debate in the botanical art community, and maybe that's why that community is dying. And I was, uh, with the, with the Botanical Artists of Canada going the way of the, the dinosaurs, um, I was kind of hoping, you know, okay, I'm not a representative for a botanical art uh, organization anymore, and maybe I can start expressing these thoughts in a way that doesn't risk bringing other people into it, um, and see where the thoughts about it are in the rest of the botanical art community. Um, so far, haven't gotten a huge amount of traction. I don't know how much I want to start. Nonsense. Maybe. Sorry, um... Maybe it's a naming thing, plant portraits would be a better description. Well, yes, but even portraits, right? So if you have, if you paint portraits of people and you say the only value portraits of people are those that have no scars on their face, right? And you are painting a, say, a community, a specific community of people who all have, they spend a lot of time in the sun, right? So you're painting, you're trying to paint like people from different communities. You paint somebody who spends a lot of time in the sun and as a result they get uh, sun scabs or freckles. Freckles, freckles are a good example. Freckles, right? Freckles. Some people are prone to freckles. You only get freckles if you go in the sun. If you made an arbitrary rule about it's only you only paint, paint people as they would be in isolation. Freckles are a thing that you get from the sun. Your portraits cannot contain freckles. 
my opinion is that that would make portraits less accurate. Scientifically, <laughs> realistically, it would make them less accurate. Likewise, if you said, I can, you can paint people, but no, no scars, no cuts, no bruises, no acne pock marks, no anything. My opinion is, if you're painting portraits of specific people, and they have a big cut across their cheek, you paint the big cut. That, that is part of the portrait. Um, but in botanical art tradition, you do not paint damage. You do not paint um, plants that have been impacted by something exterior to them. So you don't paint a leaf that has been skeletonized by predatory insects. Even if when you go outside and you look for this plant, you're going to find most of them have this particular problem, you don't represent it. Unless, if and only if, there have been some moves to start doing this. Um, so I'm not gonna, like, there are some very accepted artists in the botanical art community who do paint damaged plants, but then it's one specific type of damage caused by a specific thing, and that is the collection. Um, and even that is this sort of like, okay, well, it's botanical, I guess, because it's a plant, but that's a, that's it, that gall there is from an insect. So if you were to add the insect crawling out, you know, a gall is a insect egg, the plant grows around it. Um, if you add the insect gr climbing out, is that a botanical piece? Um, I think that a lot of these discussions only serve to alienate people who could absolutely be involved um, and benefit from a botanical art community. Uh, but, uh, you know, other people feel differently. It's because of the function, but not every piece of botanical art is going to scientific journals. Yes, absolutely. Um, and in fact, most aren't today. So there's that. Like, a lot of that comes from scientific journals. Um, and in that sense, I understand a lot more of the conventions because, for example, the white paper isn't just about, um, it's not just about, like, no distractions. It's also about the historically how journals have been printed. Um, you're trying to fit a lot of information into one image, so adding extra information might not be beneficial. Like, if you know that this plant usually presents in a certain way, I would argue that it's more useful to include, say, the nibbles if you have a plant that's always nibbled, right? Um, but you might not know that if you're just finding a new plant. Again, there's some like colonial considerations there where like, okay, yes, you're studying botany, but what exactly are you studying? How are you studying it? Um, and is this convention really the best for botanical art, for botany, for what? Um, or is it just a holdover of how we see nature? I don't know. Like not using whites or no bl black pigment rules. Yeah, yeah, so it, it basically that. Where, like, 
Um, in a lot of cases, I do feel like, okay, well, there's some, there's some sense there. And I'm, again, I'm not going to say that I'm never going to paint a white background again, because sometimes, sometimes, sometimes it's appropriate, and sometimes that's what you want to do. But I think that the rigidity with which these rules are presented, um, it's not even enforced. Like, the truth is, once you're part of, once you're in the in club, once you're part of the botanical art community, once you've, you know, shown your chops and you paint a bunch of things following all the rules, then you go out and you start pushing them. People paint larger than life or they paint flawed plants or they paint, um, Um, and this is, you know, respected botanical artists, or uh, or they paint pollinator insects, or they whatever, and that is somewhat more accepted. Um, I think the real problem is that, as a community, um, there's a real like. I guess it's it's it comes out of maybe insecurity, where um, people are people within the botanical arts community, not everyone, but there's certainly a lot of people who are very eager to uh, cast doubt on whether something is botanical. It's like the, um, you know, the stereotype of the pushy vegan. Like, well, that's not vegan. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of like that. It's kind of like that. Well, that's not botanical. Um, which I think is really harmful because you get people who are just like, you know, you don't, it, it alienates people who might be interested and who might even end up following some of these conventions um, with a little bit more exposure and like reason for choosing it. Um, but you'll get people who like, oh, I went, I'm a gardener. I really like plants. And I went into my garden and I painted this plant and you'll get, they'll post it on a Facebook group or they'll join a, a botanical art society and they'll get a whole bunch of people jumping down their throats saying, well, that's not botanical because blah, because it has cast shadows. And that's not botanical because, you know, you painted a background. I don't, your, your painting of your vine shouldn't include your fence. That's a still life, not botanical. Um, and I think that that alienates people. I think it alienates people who are valuable to encourage to paint plants. I think it creates an, an aura of exclusivity um, that ultimately is going to lead to the collapse of this um, field as a as an independent entity. Um, That's my little rant. <laughs> yeah, happy to hear thoughts on that. <laughs> I can be opinionated sometimes. Very opinionated, apparently. black and white rules, um, but specifically when people talk about the black and white, like don't use black, don't use white, as like, well, that's not a real watercolor painting because you used black. 
that's not a real watercolor painting you used white. Which, by the way, botanical artists also love expressing those two thoughts very much. Um, there's a real, like, it's exactly the same sort of people. Well, that's not real. Blah, blah, blah. Um, uh, so, kind of like the black and white rules. Um, I think that a lot of these, like, don't paint backgrounds, blah, 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 conventions, they come from a place, which may not make sense in all contexts, but there's a reason why they exist. Understanding that reason is helpful in some, in some contexts to some people. So I can totally understand if you come in and you're asking for advice on like, mm, I am trying to paint this plant, but um, I'm really struggling to show um, whatever, to show some of this detail, like it's getting lost in this background. Well, remove the background. The That seems like a solution. And even phrasing it as often in um, scientific journals, it's preferred to not use a background because backgrounds can be a distraction. Or if you're teaching a class on botanical painting techniques, and you mention, often, we don't do this because whatever, that's fine. Similar to how if I'm teaching a watercolor class, I will often say, well, I don't use white very frequently because extra challenges with white. You can achieve most of the same things by just using um, the transparency of watercolor and then you don't have to worry about blue shift or um, white makes your watercolors less transparent, blah, 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 blah. All of these reasons why you can preferentially not use white. Um, I don't think that there's anything wrong with expressing those things. In fact, I think that a lot of these things should be expressed. Um, these rules exist for a reason. Um, and sometimes it's useful to know that reason. But I do think that just like you shouldn't say, that's not a watercolor because it uses black, um, you really shouldn't go around and say, that's not a botanical art piece because it uses a background or a nibbled leaf or a pollinator insect. Um, I don't think that that's helpful. And I think that, I think that not only is it not helpful, but unlike the, certainly, the white rule, which I actually do think, not that there aren't, there are definitely people who break the white rule very effectively, um, but it definitely is the sort of thing where like, yeah, but it's definitely helpful for every beginner, or a beginner watercolor painter to learn to paint without white or using less white if they want to create artwork that looks um, watercolory, like that shows transparency. If that's, if they are attracted to that, if you want to use white, or sorry, if you're tempted to use white, I think that, that, that it really does beg the question of, are you aiming for more of a watercolor look or a gouache look? Because if you're aiming for more of a watercolor technique, more of a watercolor look, then it's useful to learn to paint without white. Even if you then later on add in white in, in passages, it's useful to learn to paint without white in a way that I don't really know that it's useful for every botanical painter to learn to paint without backgrounds. I'm not as convinced of that one. Um, similarly, like black, 
is sort of like that for me. I don't use a whole lot of black. Um, I think that understanding color theory is useful, but that there is a real um, chosen look that uses, if not black, then certainly um, plenty of uh, like Payne's Gray or what have you for shadows that gives a certain tied together aesthetic to paintings. Um, and if that is what you are going for, then you absolutely should use black or Payne's Gray or something. Um, because that's how you achieve that look. Um, so I think that in that case, it's more similar to like, okay, what are you trying to achieve here? Which is more, more my feeling on the, the botanical art thing is like, are there cases where you want a white background? Absolutely, but it should be a, if you're trying to achieve a specific thing. Like, I want to take this, this object out of its environment to take a close look at this thing that you otherwise wouldn't notice because it blends in with the environment. Good. That makes sense. Okay, and on that note, I think I am done with this painting. Or as done as I'm likely to get. I say as I'm still picking up, picking at it, but, um... But I think that this is largely where I end. Um... I'm pretty happy with this and what I've done with it. Um, and so I think that I'm just going to call this off unless somebody has more comments on my rant or my painting or something. I'm just going to... As I said that, I stepped away and I realized that there's a couple of things that I do need to fill in in here. Pretty happy with this, all things considered. Pretty happy with how this all came together. Yep, add a little bit more of this bright tone to some of these that are looking a little bit washed out. Anyway, um, yeah, thanks everyone. I'm just gonna stop this and. Hmm. I think I'm calling this off. So, um, bye, thank you for joining. Have a great evening, rest of your night. I am heading off now. Um, oh, as always, uh, don't forget to join the um, Discord channel. It's in the video description. If you haven't already, uh, you're also welcome to come support me on Patreon. Um, I will be doing a Patreon exclusive stream on Sunday. I'm actually going to set that up and post the details just now. I think I will be doing a special on various techniques for painting um, leaf veins. Uh, and then 
Um, there's also a Discord um, channel, like a within my server um, for Patreon supporters, uh, where I'll be posting some votes for the next Patreon stream, and I have some other great benefits. And I should be sending out some physical rewards to a few of my supporters. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.